I'm Ron Daniels. I'm a lawyer in Middle Georgia. I have a very general practice. Uh, part of it has been representing governmental entities, uh, candidates, uh, individuals like that, in a number of matters. Um, I am going to sort of sit back and, and let my co-panelists do a presentation, and then I'm going to hop back in in the Q&A. Uh, I just want to give a disclaimer that uh, if you've not paid me, I'm not your attorney. Uh, I'm only licensed to practice in Georgia. I can't give you legal advice if you're not my client. Uh, and there may be some things that I cannot answer for professional reasons, uh, and I apologize in advance for that. All right. Thanks, Ron. Good to be with you here today. And thanks, uh, Scott and the uh, Electronic Frontiers Foundation for doing this. It's really exciting. It's the first time I've uh, been presented <laughs> at uh, – <laughs> First time I presented at Dragon Con. We've talked about doing this for several years, but we haven't done it yet. I'm going to jump right into this as fast as I can to leave as much time for questions and answers. The, posing the question today, can we trust Georgia's Dominion voting system, or really even the previous system, the Debo system? So going all the way back, uh, I got into this in 2001 when Secretary of State Kathy Cox was evaluating new systems, including the one that Scott has got here in front of us. It's what we call a paperless DRE system, direct recording electronic. Uh, and I uh, wrote at that time, uh, and you can probably just barely see the letter up there, but the, um, to Assistant Secretary Barnes and Professor Williams that this system, you cannot verify the votes, you can't audit. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm not, you want me to get closer? Thank you. Uh, you can't audit the votes, how's that, a little bit better. You cannot verify the votes, and you can't recount the votes. It just reprints the previous unverifiable results. So it's not transparent. Um, they ignored us, and ironically, at this time, the General Assembly actually legalized this type of voting. It used to be uh, illegal to have an unverifiable voting system, but in 2001 and two, they actually did that. So the Secretary of State ignored all these warnings and she purchased this system for $54 million of your taxpayer money, even though it was unverifiable to the voter. And in 2002, uh, and this is what's going to be interesting, had the other gentleman stayed along a little bit, but I'm going to show you how both Democrats and Republicans have been cheated uh, over the last 20 years in elections. So we are a nonpartisan organization. 2002, the system was patched. The system was patched, and it was not recertified. We found out this in a, in a 2007 deposition from Professor Williams. Turned out that uh, Diebold, according to witnesses, Diebold uh, President Bobby Rosevich had applied a patch in both Fulton and DeKalb counties. The uh, Sean, uh, they then had a major upsets where Saxby Shambles upset Max Cleanan in the Senate race, Sonny Purdue upset Roy Barnes in the governor's race, but all of the down ballot races trended to Democrats. And Sean Hannity referred to this as the earthquake in Georgia all the way back in 2002. So um, I'm just going to give you a couple of examples of, of elections that seemed very, very strange. Another one was the 2017 6th District Jungle Primary, which was conducted on this machine. Uh, we had 18 candidates in that race. John Ossoff had led most of the night with 50, uh, point, 50 to 57 percent of the vote. But then suddenly Fulton County had a major computer glitch for hours, and after the correction, Ossoff suddenly dropped to 48% and was forced into a, a runoff with Karen Handel, who had 19%. And then after uh, the, in the runoff, Karen Handel went from 19 to 51%. So you know, she got all the percentage from all these other votes all these other uh, candidates, there was 16 candidates were eliminated, and John Ossoff's vote percentage did not change uh, at all. Uh, very strange outcome there. Fast forward to Lieutenant Governor's race. In 2018, Jeff Duncan won a GOP primary uh, over David Schaefer with about 900 votes, uh, a very, very, uh, very closely contested uh, election in which he got a lot of dark money, about two billion of dark money at the last minute to uh, win that. He then went on to face uh, Democrat Sarah Riggs Amico in the uh, lieutenant governor's race. And this was, uh, this, she, she suffered a, an undervote of about 5%, which is unprecedented in American uh, history. I don't know if you can see that slide, but her vote totals dropped way, way down. 
and then it goes back up uh, as normal to as you go down ballot with the Secretary of State's office and the um, Attorney General and so on and so on. That everything else tracked normally, but for some reason that race had a tremendous uh, undervote. And what we found out when we did a report, you can see up here on the top right, we found out that the Lieutenant Governor's race was randomly non-displayed in minority districts but displayed if uh, it was selected when you went to the summary screen. So sometimes you didn't get to the lieutenant governor's race, and particularly in, in uh, heavily Democrat areas, and then it was then displayed later if you went to the screen, if you noticed it. So that's how they got around that in 2018. So fast forward, we had filed a lawsuit in 2006 to try to get some of this mess straightened out. The Georgia Supreme Court blew us off and uh, said that, sorry, uh, you know, voters have to bear the responsibility for unequal voting systems. 2019, the U.S. District Court found that the DBOL DRE was unconstitutional, which was exactly what I would said back in 2002. So 17 years later, I was finally proven uh, right. Uh, that made me feel a little good. But then uh, the legislature went out and mandated uh, electronic ballot marking devices, very similar to this to screen, but they said, well, don't, don't worry about it. These will print a paper trail. And so that's, uh, this will be better. And well, Brad Raffensperger then spent $107 million on a system that uh, uh, has a QR code on it. As you can see, uh, the QR code and the votes are accumulated out of that QR code. Wouldn't be so bad if there's a QR code on the ballot, but the votes are in there, so you cannot verify the votes, your own votes. So the U.S. District Court in 2020 found that this system, the, uh, the, the, uh, the new system, violated Georgia election law. Uh, Georgia election law says that you have to print an elector verifiable paper ballot and the system has to produce ballots that are marked with the elector's choices in a format readable by the elector. Well, who can read a QR code? That's where your votes are. So uh, she said plaintiffs and other voters who wish to vote in person, you know, and that's for early voting or election day, they have to vote on a system that does none of those things. And that was Judge uh, uh, Amy Totenberger. Totenberg, and so this happened just before the 2020 election. They didn't have a chance to change anything. So think about that. The 2020 election was conducted on a system that the United States District Court found was illegal. Now, an illegal system uh, in Georgia law, and, and Ron, Ron can tell you more about this than I can probably, but uh, if if the, if a contract that has an illegal purpose is void, according to the case precedents that I'm uh, showing you there. So uh, the contract that Brad Rattensburg and Gabe Sterling signed with Dominion is technically void uh, because the U.S. District Court has found that the system has, uh, you know, really is, is in violation of Georgia law, even though she has not issued any relief for that yet. And uh, we, we're trying to get them, you know, get some relief for that as well. Um, fast forward, let's look at a couple of the failures going to go all the way back to 2020 now. And, we're, and this was with the, not the old system, but now with the new system that has this QR code on it. Uh, Coffee County was unable to get their voting system to produce correct election results on 2020. They had to certify their hand count. They, uh, three times it failed, they, it, it added, uh, it added uh, votes which weren't there. Then it didn't recognize new votes that they found to put in. So finally, they brought all this before the Georgia House and Senate Committee in 2020, and they uh, provided a bunch of documentation for the committee. We did a press release on that back then. Uh, so that's a little bit about what happened in 2020 in Coffee County. Um, in 2022, this is an interesting case in DeKalb County. Some of you might live in DeKalb County and you may know about this. Uh, candidate Michelle Long Spears was third in the DeKalb County District 2 Commission race in 2022. And she didn't get any votes in the precinct where she and her husband lived and voted. 
So she raised this question to the election board. The election board said, hmm, something's wrong. Let's just run the recount. We'll run the machine count again and fix it. Well, they ran the machine count, and the machine produced the same results again, just like in Coffee County. So they decided they would have to do a hand count because that's the only way they could prove that the, that what the real results are. So when they did the hand count, this is what they found. hope you can see this. But they found out that uh, on the bottom is the hand count, on the top is the, um, is the original count. And you can see there that uh, Michelle Long Spears was shorted 3,000 votes. She had 4,000 votes in the hand count, but the system only gave her 1,000 votes. And the system gave her opponent 1,800 uh, more votes. Um, uh, I'm sorry, 1,400 more votes than what he actually earned, and the system failed to count 1,800 votes altogether. So uh, that is uh, an incredible an anomaly. Um, and so what did they do about this? Well, the Secretary of State said that, that it was an alignment problem. They had the candidates... Um, uh, as some of you may know, because y'all are pretty technical, that the, can the, the system uses candidate numbers and not names. So uh, the candidate numbers were off. They said that's what caused it, but that doesn't explain why 1,800 votes were not counted. Um, the, and uh, so the most important thing about this is that this is the same, uh, well, it's the same primary that Brad Raffensperger, the Secretary of State, won without having any of his votes actually audited. But uh, equally as important, it was the only race that was audited. When DeKalb County wanted to audit more races because of this one, the Secretary of State's office threatened them and tried to shut them down, threatened them with uh, legal charges and all sorts of things if they audited more races. So this was the only race that was ever audited in the May 24, 2022 primary. <laughs> So what that means is that the Dominion voting system that we use now has a 0% accuracy rate in audited May 24, 2022 primaries. It's never been proven to count a single race in that primary correct. Fast forward. Um, now, uh, before we talked about uh, uh, Democrats that appeared to be cheating. Now, here's, here's a, an issue of a Republican that appears to have been shorted over 20,000 votes. I'm showing you the GPB actual live Twitter feed from, uh, and I, you probably will not be able to see this in the back, but I'll bring it back up uh, later if y'all want to come up and take a look at it. But at 9.59 p.m. on election night, Herschel Walker had 1,551,000 votes. And at 10.04, he had 1,529,000 votes. So his vote totals had decreased by 21,000 in four minutes, according to the GPB um, report. So we, we, I, I talked to, to the elections director about this. And I said, hey, could you look into this? And he said, sure, I'll get back with you tomorrow. Well, three months later, I still hadn't heard from him. I said, hey, and I saw him in a, in a hearing. I said, hey, what happened? And he said, well, you know, we just looked at it, but um, it's not our numbers. It's the GPB's numbers. Well, I said, well, we confirmed this with WSB-TV, and we confirmed it with the Edison. It was also on the Edison line feed, uh, and that they get all their results from the counties through CIDL, which is a, a publishing, uh, um, electronic publishing, kind of a clearinghouse thing. And uh, we never have, uh, there's no explanation for why this happened. So these are, I wanted to give you a little bit of historical background about how both Democrats and Republicans appear to have been cheated in different races by these uh, machines. So fast forward to um, Dr. Haldeman. Uh, Alex Haldeman, as you all know, has a, sec uh, a security uh, report, a security analysis that he just has finally been released after two years. And he's an expert witness in this Curling v. Ravensburger case that we were talking about earlier. Uh, the Curling case um, is uh, the one that Judge Totenberg uh, found that the machines were, in fact, unconstitutional and that the machines, other, the new ones, violated the law. Well, Alex Haldeman is an expert witness in that case. And here's something that's interesting that you may not know about him. So Alex Haldeman 
was on the graduate student team with Dr. Felton, who, and they hacked this very machine, or this one exactly like this, in front of the United States Congress in 2006. And this is a picture of Dr. Felton from Princeton University. Alex Haldron is over there um, on the left-hand side, um, Halderman, and then uh, Professor Felton put three votes in, all cast for George Washington. He printed the election results from the same exact same type of machine, and he found out that Benedict Arnold had won two votes to one, and he did this live in front of the U.S. Congress. So um, Dr. Haldeman has this report, this security analysis report that y'all mostly have heard about. We can, I'm just going to give you a few highlights. He talked about all these things, uh, encryption, encoding, QR codes, so on and so on. I'm just going to give you a couple of, of highlights. So um, you know, basically the bottom line uh, is this QR code is encrypted, it is encoded so that you can't read it even with a QR code reader, but it's not encrypted so the hackers can hack it. So it's the worst of both worlds. Uh, it also does not detect duplicates according to Dr. Haldeman and of course this is pretty well known. We've known most of these things for 15 years. So. Um, an attacker can change the QR code and put different votes in there from the vo votes that they would really like, or they can change the QR code and the human readable text so it will defeat an audit. And this is one of the conclusions that um, Dr. Haldeman made. He also, y'all might remember the cards that you get, um, the poll worker, uh, I'm sorry, the voter cards when you go in, you check in, you get a card, you take the card over, and you cast one vote on the machine. Well, Dr. Haldeman was able to forge these cards. He forged not only the voter card, which has very limited privileges, but he forged the poll worker card, which has more privileges, and he even forged the technician card, which has almost unlimited uh, un unlimited uh, privileges. So he concluded that that card that he forged will work in any uh, ICX, which is the touchscreen, the New Dominion touchscreen, across the entire state of Georgia. So he can take that and go and then use it to any machine, and he can even take it into other jurisdictions that have the same type of, of equipment that we do. That's like Maricopa County or um, Antrim, Michigan, so on, that's, that sort of thing. So um, Dr. Haldeman is, um, talked about logic and axiom. I was so happy he put this in there because this is the same thing we've been saying for 15 years. He says logic and axiom testing, which if you ask the elections officials, they say, don't worry, this will fix it. You know, we, we all, we're always checking these things. Well, he explains how you can bypass logic and axiom testing if you have malware by making the system cheat only on uh, certain days, not on the day that they're doing logic and axiom testing, but on the day of the election or early voting. And he also said you, can, you only have to test one ballot in Georgia procedures, so what you can do is program it to skip the cheating on the first number, n number of ballots, and then it'll start cheating after that. So the bottom line of his, uh, his, what he's saying there is no practical method of pre-election or parallel testing can rule out malware-based fraud. And then he talked again about spreading malware and how it can spread to all BMDs uh, in the county. So the way this ha works is uh, the systems um, are, are pro programmed at the Secretary of State's office. You know, they'll say, well, it's not pro the systems aren't connected to the internet, which, you know, can be true, but the systems are prepped by a system that is connected to the internet. That's in the Secretary of State's office. There's a very famous case that some of you might be aware of where a uh, Bastille uh, team researcher uh, found that the voting system in 2017 was exposed to the internet, the, I'm sorry, not the voting system, but the, the election server that the Secretary of State uses to program the voting systems. And he found that that was um, exposed to the internet. So he went to um, 
the director of the Center for Election Systems, which programs these machines out in Kennesaw State, and he says, you've got a problem. Your central election server that programs all these different counties uh, and, or sends them the files, that one is, is open to any, for anyone to, to, uh, in the whole world to put malware on. And the, uh, Merle King said, thank you, we'll try to uh, close this and fix this loop. But six months later, it was still not closed. So the system, as we found out, that, that bug, which is uh, called Drupal Geddon, it's, it's on the Drupal um, web content system, allowed, uh, it's a very famous bug, and y'all probably, a lot of you in the room are probably aware of it. That had been implemented back in 2003, so the system had been wide open for uh, to the internet since 2003, all the way up to 2017 when this was, when this was um, found. But Dr. Hahnemann explains that uh, you know this is how you have to be very very careful about spreading the the malware in that way. Also on the scanners, he found that the scanners, the ICP, which is again that's the precinct scanner, it didn't require ballots to be printed on security paper. And it accepted photocopied ballots. So uh, you just go out and photocopy the ballots, and uh, you can then, you have to check out that somebody voting those things, you can introduce counterfeit ballots into the real, real count. So that was another problem, and, and he didn't even uh, focus on the scanners. He just barely touched uh, on those. So just to sum up the whole thing of what, what Dr. Dr. Hallman says, he says, no grand conspiracies would be necessary to commit large-scale fraud. And uh, so we're not a conspiracy theorist after all. And he says that this system was developed without sufficient attention to security during design, software engineering, and testing. And it would be extremely difficult to retrofit that security into a system that was not initially produced with such a process. So uh, basically what he's saying there is this system is broke and it cannot be fixed, which is kind of what we've been saying for about 15 years. So Secretary of State took some offense to this and he wrote, he published this uh, letter saying, setting the election security record straight. And what he, he sent this out to all the elections directors and the legislators in, the, in Georgia. And he said, you don't have to worry we have a MITRE report, and this MITRE report refutes everything that Dr. Hogman has said. So, okay, so you know, you always have two sides to, to a story. Uh, so, what the, so this MITRE report, you know, we looked at it, and we immediately found that it's unsigned. No one in the entire world was willing to put their name on that MITRE report that allegedly refuted Dr. Haldeman. It was funded by Dominion Voting Systems, hardly a partial, an impartial organization, and it was produced without any access to the voting system. Dr. Haldeman uh, worked on that for 12 weeks. He had 12 weeks of access. Uh, Miters, the MITRE report, no one ever even looked at the system. They just made these conclusions without really doing any real analysis. So 29 cybersecurity experts produced a letter and they sent it to the CEO of MITRE and he said, this, this is absolutely ridiculous. Your report is ridiculous. You need to retract it. And, he said, and they said it was also it's dangerous. And they mentioned that three, three times. So we sent a letter to explain all of that to all the elections officials and the, and the legislators. And we, um, we fact-checked Brad Ravensburger's original letter. And we found out in his original letter that he sent to the legislators and the general uh, and the uh, elections directors, we found out that he had five false statements, six mostly false statements, and five pants on fire lies. So just to finish up, um, why is Dr. Halderman correct? Well, okay, uh, several more reasons I just want to add into here. The counties have no means to detect malware if it is delivered to their system. You know, all of the focus is on, oh, well, the system, these voting machines are not connected to the internet. Uh, that, even that's debatable. But the problem is, 
they can receive the malware from the Secretary of State's office. Every election has to be programmed from the Secretary of State's office, and then the counties program their voting machines from that software. So it's what we call in the business a single point of attack. If you compromise the single point of attack at the Secretary of State's office, then you can compromise the whole system. Um, federal certification tests are funded by voting systems vendors. As you saw, MITRE's system test is funded by voting system vendors. And um, all the voting systems use a lot of foreign components in the supply chain. So that is, they are not uh, tested properly to ensure they're not uh, having uh, malware on them either. Now, and if they were to be used in a defense system, uh, the Defense Department would break down every little component and then recheck uh, it for every little detail before they would ever use a foreign chip or anything like that in one of their systems. We don't do that in elections. Um, in regards to connections to the Internet, we did find in both Michigan and Colorado, some of the uh, researchers there um, found uh, the, um, uh, you know, the, and these are experts who have evaluated the systems, the same system that we have here. Uh, and they found that the Dominion installation activates the wireless profiles and the drivers on the native Dell chipset that is used for the election management servers. So the Dells, the Dells are used and they, their chipset is activated. So why is Dominion activating wireless connectivity if they don't really ever want to use it? So bottom line is no study has found that the electronic voting systems are secure. So uh, uh, I would argue today that what we really need to do is to unplug Georgia from uh, all electronic equipment do uh, cast uh, on cast your votes on hand marked paper ballots and publicly record hand counts in the in the voting locations so that everyone knows who won and then there's no argument there's no there's no disagreement with uh, people uh, going back and forth and saying this you know this this person won this time but we can't prove it. So that would solve the problem. We can unseal the ballots, make those public record to resolve any discrepancies, have better chain of custody, and then just unleash a lot of transparency on the back end process. There's still a lot of things that the public doesn't have visibility into. Um, so uh, just a little bit about us to wrap up. We are an uh, all volunteer organization, and uh, we don't take salaries, and we are uh, 501c3, we are nonpartisan. I gave you examples of both Democrats and Republicans who appear to have been shorted with these machines over different times over the last 20 years. So that said, I'll race through that real quick so we can open it up for, let Ron have a few comments and maybe Scott and then have, have questions. Questions and answers. Ron, you good? I'm, I'm fine just you going good? straight to Q&A. Yeah. All right. Uh, so uh, we'll just open it up for questions. I know that was really, really fast. So um, we can uh, back up to any slide. If I went too fast, please just go ahead and, uh, and, and uh, ask anything you'd like to know. I think I actually went a little bit too fast. I should have gone a little bit slower. But uh, uh, anybody, anybody have any questions? Yes, sir. Go ahead. Yeah, the mic is right there. Thanks for coming to Dragon Con. Uh, nice great to be you. here. Looking forward to coming back. It's a shame this room isn't packed because this is probably the most impactful thing that everybody here experiences. Um, a million questions, but to start off with one easy one. Is any state doing a good job here? Are all 50 bad? Is there a model? Yeah, great question. Um, unfortunately, all the states have issues, and most of the issues are that they don't make ballots public record. So what almost all the states in America do is they secretly count the votes and they tell you who won. It's like Wizard of Oz voting. You know, it's the man behind the curtain is going to tell you who won and you can't see. So that is almost all the states are doing that. So I would say there really is not a good model uh, for voting uh, right now. Follow up question. Sure. Go Since ahead. no one's behind me. We got a half hour. <laughs> Um, is this your first time at DragonCon, even as a human? Uh, 
Well, I used to work down here, and so every year I'd kind of uh, walk around Dragon Con, but I haven't actually didn't participate. So this year I brought my uh, my QR code uh, costume with me, there you go. Uh, to, so I could be a full fledged uh, member. Well, the reason I ask is we have a track called Skeptics, so Connors love a great conspiracy. So my question to you is: Is there a big dark conspiracy here, um, or is this just a really bad technology that people are learning how to game the system on because it seems like you're not trying to point a finger in any particular direction so i'm just curious to see how you can fuel yeah. the conspiracy yeah. track here so uh yeah i would i would um i was careful not to point fingers however you've hit a really great point and that is there is a conspiracy this is this is one of the worst greatest conspiracies, I think, in, in American history. And it's, it is um, it's a bipartisan conspiracy. So if you notice, um, and we found clear evidence of wrongdoing in Fulton County, uh, counterfeit ballots in 2020. We found um, uh, illegalities that are on video, in the State Farm Arena video, but yet the Secretary of State, who's an alleged Republican, comes out uh, in, and protects the Democrats in Fulton County. And we've had uh, you know, the same, similar situations in reverse. Um, when, you know, in, the, uh, in the original history examples that I was giving, you know, the same thing happened in, in reverse, where the Democrats, Secretary of State, Cassidy Cox, said there was no problem when in reality it is. So it's really, it's severe. And, and um, we, you know, we've made so many attempts at very logical things. Like, uh, for example, let's just make the ballots public record. And then everybody can verify the results. Everybody knows who won. There can't be any dispute, you know, if you can actually see it with your own eyes. Well, we, get, we're, we're, uh, we got fought, we were opposed tooth and nail. Um, when we did that, by both the Democrats and the Republicans. And uh, Fulton County went out and hired, uh, um, they hired criminal defense attorneys just to prevent us from looking at the ballots. And the Secretary of State turns around and files an amicus brief in our case, trying to prevent us from looking at the ballots. And then when we confronted him on that, with that on a radio show, he said, oh, the Attorney General did it. Well, the Attorney General doesn't do anything uh, that the Secretary of State doesn't tell him because he did it for the Secretary of State. Uh, and you know, he would not have done that. So you've got this, it is, it's a massive conspiracy and it, um, it involves both parties, but there's something even more nefarious uh, about this. I'll give you another example. We were down at the, this was their Republican event. It was at the fish fry last week. and. Governor Kemp was there, and or he was invited, and the 8th District, which is the down in Perry, Georgia, just south of Macon, they did not want us to be there. Voter GA were nonpartisan. Now, we did speak at the state GOP convention and were really warmly received, but they didn't want us there. And that, that, didn't, that didn't surprise me too much, but they didn't want anybody wearing an election integrity T-shirt of any kind nothing to do with elections. And uh, this is incredibly bizarre behavior. And so why, you know, why would this be going on? Well, it turns out that that was the condition that Governor Kemp had put on, on the 8th District Chair and the committee in order to speak there. Well, why would he be so uh, concerned that he doesn't even want to be seen even with uh, or have a picture taken, even with somebody wearing an election integrity t-shirt in the background. It wasn't just us, it was two or a couple of other organizations. So that, get, so that ra you know, ra raises some serious questions. I, mean, I, know, uh, you know, I know Governor Kemp and there's something, he would not have done that on his own. He, somebody is telling him to do that. So there's something really sinister and evil controlling the politicians all the way up through the governor's office. It's really, really, um, it's really a, a, a tremendous concern. So yeah, absolutely, it is a tremendous conspiracy, but we don't know who, uh, what, uh, what is really behind it. You know, is it deep state? Is it China? Is it the, uh, you know, what, is it the CIA? Is it, um, 
you know, you can go through uh, uh, a variety of sources, World Economic Forum, you know, the camp was at Davios. But so no one really knows for sure, but it's clear that there's something really seriously wrong uh, when you've got all these government officials who don't want to do just common sense things to make sure that everybody's happy uh, and we're conducting uh, elections properly. Uh, to so, jump in on that, and, sure. and, and I'm not... I'm not saying there is or is not a conspiracy, but if the hypothesis is that there is a conspiracy, um, I, I think the concern I have is what do you ever do to solve for the conspiracy? Uh, you could go to, as, as Mr. Favorito has advocated for, paper ballots with you know, full manual counts, but then you look in 1946 when uh, we had the three governors controversy and just magically there were all these absentee ballots for Herman Talmadge and the Telford County probate judge's office. Um, you know, you, you look at all these other issues where people have been paid to go cast their votes. So if it's a conspiracy that we can't figure out, I don't know how you fix it. Uh, well, I think you can fix it with just simple legislation. We have a, a whole bunch of bills uh, before the legislature right now even if you can't figure out who's in the background or, or if it's somebody in the background, you can fix the problem by simply passing legislation. So um, we have a, and one of the bills is a, a bill to unseal the ballots. That would solve the problem in Georgia. Um, and it's ironic, um, the, um, uh, that used to be supported by the Democrats, but then when the Republicans had the chance to pass it, then the Democrats were against it. The Republicans were against it when the Democrats had it. So it's just, you know, we kind of go back and forth. It's really, uh, it's really, really bizarre. But there's several bills available that can, um, that can uh, fix the problem, and uh, we can't seem to get those passed. And one of them, well, this, and if I'll give you another example, we can just go on and on. But um, uh, Senate Bill 89 from last year was a bill that, uh, as you all know, there were, and the legislature has a Republican majority. So we had uh, unanimous support. This bill would have unsealed the ballots and it would have provided a better chain of custody. No brainer. Every Republican in the House voted for the bill. It went over to the Senate. Every Republican in the Senate uh, was ready to vote for the bill. It was carried by the president pro tem of the Senate. At that time, it was Butch Miller. And they brought it up, he brought it up for a vote uh, on Sani Dial. We were literally one minute from getting that passed into law. And the lieutenant governor, who was presiding over the Senate, Jeff Duncan, calls the president of the, pro, of the, of the president pro tem of the Senate out of order. And in reality, he has top priority to introduce whatever he wants to do what he wants to do. So this was really bizarre. They went back and forth. They had voted on it, um, and it was a big, big ordeal. But bottom line is one guy, Lieutenant Governor Jeff Duncan, who has very nefarious background, uh, was able to block that bill from getting passed in spite of unanimous Republican support. Um, and you just have one and more and more bizarre situations like that. But I think you can fix it with, with legislation. You can also fix it the counties can unplug themselves from this system because, and um, this is an interesting debate, but the counties have uh, legal authority as well, uh, and uh, we have a whole other presentation on that legal authority that they could exercise to do, to do um, uh, some of that as well. So there's several different avenues we're trying to take. We're trying to fight all three different ways that we possibly can, uh, executive branch, legislative branch, and judicial branch, and we you know, hope we'll, we'll get a solution for you before 2024 elections. Anybody? Yes, yes sir. Um, yeah, uh, you had a lot to say uh, about the, the, the digital machines, obviously, and whatnot, um, mm -hmm. and, and noted when uh, Mr. Halderman said in his report, you know, no grand conspiracy. Uh, but, but I note that the first bullet point here, like, like uh, you alluded to this a second ago on the flyer, is uh, attests, attestations to tens of thousands of counterfeit mail-in ballots in Fulton County alone. Um, do you have, that, that, that sounds like a grand conspiracy to me, to be mm -hmm. honest. 
Well, um, well, they are sworn affidavits. I understand the sworn yeah, affidavits. Yeah. I'm not, I, but right. but but I, I'm I'm an attorney myself. The the, mm -hmm. the affidavit only goes so far as proof. Um, wh what what do you contend are the origins of these tens of thousands of intentionally counterfeit ballots? Uh, we don't know because we can't we can't see them. So that, that this gets back to the same problem. <clears throat> this is an interesting story, and thank you for asking this question. So we went into court. Uh, and uh, the judge made this bizarre ruling after 10 months, and he said that, uh, I think we, you don't have standing. Now, as being an attorney, you will know that standing is, is, is resolved right at the beginning of a lawsuit, not after 10 months later. So he makes this ruling, we know it's false, and uh, we go, uh, we appeal it, the Court of Appeals upholds this this crazy ruling. So we we appeal it to this Georgia Supreme Court, and the Georgia Supreme Court rules in our favor. They said, wait a minute, a citizen resident taxpayer has always had standing to sue a government agency or official who violates the law, and they kicked it back to the to the Court of Appeals, and they and they did this unanimously. No all, no, all the Democrats and Republicans who are on that, on that court, they all agreed that that was the case. And they said, it's always been that way. Ever since the state was established in 1788, we continue to recognize that. So they kicked that court, that case back to the Court of Appeals. And now we're excited because now we're finally going to get to open discovery and see the ballots. And we can find out how many there are. And the Court of Appeals has sat on that case for six months. And they have not taken it back to the to the Superior Court. Is that not the case that's back in front of Judge McBurney? No, no. That, uh, so the, the, the Judge Amaro yes. attempted to uh, route that case to Judge McBurney, who we believe to be probably the most uh, uh, partial judge in Fulton County, and we uh, filed a motion to recuse him. But, but that, that means the case, but, the case is in front of Judge McBurney no, for you to file no, a motion to no, recuse. No, 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 it's not. And here's what, I know it's complicated. Judge Amaro did that before he had actually gotten the case. The Court of Appeals has never remitted that case back to the Superior Court, and Judge Amaro actually did that before he had received the remitter which he never got. We, as soon as we saw that he was going to do that, we filed the motion to recuse. But n none of that is being uh, um, uh, adjudicated yet because the Court of Appeals is still sitting on, on our victory from the Georgia Supreme Court. So these are the things. So we have the sworn affidavits, and we are being blocked by a corrupt ruling. And in fact, a judge literally lied and said that we didn't have standing, and that, that delayed us for two and a half years from getting to the truth about how many ballots there are. Ultimately, Judge Amaro was correct that like half of the plaintiffs were still dismissed, right, for not having standing. Well, that, so, uh, um, according, not a, a not According a, to the Court of Appeals. According, ultimately, according, the, according the, everyone who was in Fulton Appeals. County However, had standing. However, All the plaintiffs who weren't in Fulton County did not yes. have standing. So, how, however, those plaintiffs were, um, were, they have appealed back to the Georgia Supreme Court. I am a Fulton County one, so I'm, oh, I'm, good. You, you I'm, stay. I'm, I'm good to go. But those, those um, actually went back to the Supreme Court on the appeal because what the, what the, what the, um, the, judge ruled, the Supreme Court ruled is that mm -hmm. a community stakeholder uh, it, uh, has, has standing. And their argument back is that the Court of Appeals erred again because a community stakeholder in a statewide election is anyone in the state, not anyone in the county. So that's a no-brainer argument that I think that the Georgia Supreme Court will find in our favor again and will overturn the Court of Appeals for a second time and then we'll see what happens. But that's the background of the case. But I'm, I'm glad you brought that up there. Okay. Is that? Um, what did I say here? Um, I, Judge Amaro did eventually, correct me if I'm wrong if you got a possession of these, but you did end up with the Fulton County um, ballot images for the, for the mail-in, for the mail-in and Dropbox ballots, right? Yes, we did yes. get the, we we did get the ballot images, yes. um, and that was made law. We we argued yes. for ballot images to make law. However, here's what we found out in our March 17th. 
We found out that after uh, an extensive analysis that the electronic ballot images, which are required to produce the cast vote records and certify the results, those ballot images were electronically altered before Fulton County certified the 2020 results. Altered in what way? Like the metadata was altered or like the images of, of who was voted for was altered? Well, we, we learned it was a wholesale replacement of the images. So we don't know what the original images are. We can just tell from the metadata that those images had been altered. And we found out not just one way, but a half a dozen different ways. Okay. So uh, that's how we knew. So, so that means that the ballot images are not valid. From that point in time on, we knew that we had to seek actual ballots. And that is what's being prevented uh, from us, us from seeing. No, uh, nobody wants to show us real ballots so that we can verify the results in well, any race. Thus far, in the review of the, the images that you do have, how many of the tens of thousands of counterfeit ballots have been identified? Well, well, you you can't identify a counterfeit ballot with a 200 DPI uh, resolution, which is what Dominion. Um, so is the answer none? So, so you can't. There, you have no mechanism until there is an independent copy. This is what we've been suing for for two and a half years. Until there is an independent copy uh, of 600 DPI, 16-bit color images, then you can detect the counterfeit ballots. But until that occurs, you can't, you can't detect them. And that's what we have been seeing. How, how would you detect, I mean, if, if it's tens of thousands, I assume people, you know, whatever operation is doing this well, is filling, filling them out by hand and submitting was, them in drop boxes again, or something, that, putting again, in the mailbox. Again, that box. was an estimate. That was an estimate. Okay. Ten, wait, I'm sorry. Tens of thousands is an well, estimate. Well, you're correct. We don't know the exact number because we are not allowed to see them. So the whole. You, the you, whole, you were stressing they were sworn affidavits. What What are they swearing are, there to? There are sworn affidavits from four senior poll managers. That swear to how many counterfeit ballots? That there are counterfeit ballots. One of the affiants has stated that she believes that it would go up into the tens of thousands if we could see them. Bottom line is what's interesting, and I think the point that we're losing here, is that we're not being allowed to see them to simply resolve how many there are. So you and I wouldn't have you having this discussion if we could see them. Then, then, you know, maybe there's only three. You know, we don't know. Three but, is far uh, from tens uh, of thousands. Well, but, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, but I'm exaggerating here because we already know that there are hundreds because we've literally seen uh, hundreds of ballots in a row. Uh, um, that were all marked the same way. In the ballot images. And, and all, yeah. So, no, no, not in the images. So then let, where? Let, let me go back to the mail. Okay, so the mail-in ballots, the reason yeah. they know they're counterfeit is because they were not, they were mail-in ballots, they were not folded from being mailed. How do we know they, they're not folded? They, they were, because you could tell, they were handled them in the audit. They handled them in the audit, okay? And, and these are four senior poll managers handling them. So they weren't folded from being mailed. They weren't on the correct paper stock. They weren't marked with a writing instrument. They were marked with a, uh, appear to be toner, and they, were mar and they were filled out the same way, all 100 ballots a row, uh, all down ballot races the same. Well, that so should that, be identifiable so, in the ballot images, so right? That, so if it's 100 ballots in a row all filled out the same for all the same candidates, that should show up in the ballot images. Well, uh, the you, you I mean, a hundred in a row, all filled out identically, is pretty, you know, noticeable. Well, well, you have to, regardless if it's D two hundred DPI. Yeah, so we, we we have seen some. We just don't know how many. Again, Wait, you said a hundred in a row. You, you have to you have to get the actual ballot. Well, no, I mean, the hundred in a row filled out identically see. that that be observable in two hundred DPI ballot images. Some some would be observable, yes, yeah. but but not. Uh, you you've really got to have the ballots to see. Well, why why would a hundred ballots in a row so, all filled out so, identically so that look for, like they're printed with toner so, not be noticeable okay. in the ballot images? I, I'm I'm going to have to let somebody. We got more people uh, okay. who are trying to ask ask the question, so I'm going right. well, to. I'm going to pass well, one quick one for the ballots I, you I, have I've identified really, as counterfeit. How, what's the what, what's the partisan breakdown of those? Have you counted like how many went which for which party which candidate? I'm sorry. Have, have you have we counted how many? If you, for the, all the ballots you've you've flagged as suspected as counterfeit of the well, tens we, of thousands. Well, no, we, we haven't flagged any ballots as being suspected of counterfeit because we've okay. never been we've never been able to see the ballots, and that is I, the whole point here. See, I think you're I think you're, you're you're in the weeds and you're missing the point. The simple point is. Make the ballots public record, show it to us, and then we can decide. There's no point in arguing these things 
Fulton County and the Secretary of State are preventing us from seeing the ballots, and that tells you there's something seriously wrong. Thank so you. I, I need to move on. Oh, I understand. Hi, yes, my, my name's Hedra. I use they, them pronouns. Um, so I'm from Decatur. I worked on the Abrams campaign in the 2022 mm -hmm. election. Um, so since this is a, a bipartisan um, issue, like it's just a general government governance issue, um, what kinds of things do you think can be done at the individual level? I mean, the Secretary of State's office is running the elections and they're not interested, it seems, in the transparency on the back end. Exactly. Like, what, like, we're, we're voting, but like, if we've only got two choices for a Secretary of State, maybe neither of them are super interested in transparency. Like, what kinds of things can um, individuals do to advocate for this? Well, thank you. It's a really, it's a tough question because, um, you, you, you know, you kind of hit the nail on the head there when you say you have two candidates and neither one of them are really advocating for transparency. That is a tough situation. Now, you know, we typically there's a third candidate, like a libertarian candidate, who typically does uh, advocate for transparency. Ted Metz ran as a libertarian. Y'all might remember him. He was in the debates. Um, it's a really difficult situation that we're in because the solution to the problem, as you said, is transparency. Uh, all we're looking for is transparency, and we can't get it. So what, what can you, the people, do? Um, there are different things you can do. You can, um, you can go to your county commissions and your board of elections and try to advocate for some transparency there. We are down uh, at the legislature advocating for transparency bills. Um, and and we're trying to get to um, you, know, you know the executives you know and the you know governors lieutenant governor that kind of thing trying to advocate for transparency. Um, I think if we could get um, um, some uh, bipartisanship on that, it would be great. I, I'll give you an example of a bipartisan bill. Um, there was a Senate Bill two. Well, I, I forgot what the original number was, but it was reintroduced as Senate Bill two thirty three last year. But uh, there was a bill that would have done a lot of what we want, and it was introduced by um, Jen Jordan, who ran for um, attorney general. She was a state senator to out of Cobb County. And she had a really good bill. It didn't go very uh, far because she's a Democrat, and, the, uh, and she was, it's Republican majority. However, uh, Lieutenant Governor Burt Jones um, that last year picked up that same bill and introduced it uh, as, as his bill, and she went back on there uh, as a co-sponsor of the bill um, and to show that it's, this really is a nonpartisan issue. So uh, that's, uh, you know, until we can get a little bit more, uh, I, I'd love to see them do a little bit more on that bill. It's a really good bill, um, Burt Jones and uh, Jen Jordan. Uh, so, I, but it's a tough situation. I appreciate the question. I wish I had a real uh, clear answer for you. Okay. Um, your second bullet point references the State Farm Arena video, which of course featured yeah. Ruby Freeman, Shea Moss. Uh, they were in the news this past week because mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. they were given a default judgment um, against Rudy mm -hmm. Giuliani mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. his uh, uh, statements right. about them. Um, uh, it, in, in light of that holding and everything that's happened, do, do you have anything to, to say about how Ruby Freeman and Shea Moss have been treated? Well, um, uh, no, I don't have anything to say about Ruby Freeman and Shea Moss. However, I can talk to you about State Farm Arena video. On that video, you can see five violations of Georgia law. And uh, the our, um, curved room, I, mean, I was there at, the, at, there at that day, There's, it's a curved room. Uh, you can't see around to the other side of what's going on. You can see the um, uh, skirted tables are a violation of transparency law. Hiding ballots under the table is a violation of transparency law. Uh, scanning ballots multiple times, uh, which you can see on the video, is a violation. And uh, also, as um, you see, that they come out and announce that the scanning is over, but then they um, continue to scan the ballots after the monitors left, another violation of Georgia law. Those are all, I mean, you know, I think you get sidetracked on Ruby Freeman's shame loss thing. The bottom line is that there's five violations of, of state law on that video, and Gabe Sterling, Secretary of State, I was saying that's normal ballot processing. 
It's not. Well, speaking of that, like I, I've, I've seen that um, that flyer on, on the George Voter G website, um, and like the skirted tables. Uh, what do you say about the curved room? It says it's a potential violation of OCGA twenty one two four zero six, and it says potential each time. And like, I looked up OCGA twenty one two four zero six that you said five minutes. Okay, All right. thanks. And the entire text of that statute is. Superintendents, poll officers, and other officers engaged in the conducting of primaries and elections held under this chapter shall perform their duties in public. Uh-huh. That's so, it. That's so, the end. So, so is, where, where is, do, where do okay. skirted tables come? Is there so, precedent? Is, so, there, is there established precedent okay. saying that skirted tables so are allowed? So is hiding ballots under the skirted table, is that performing your duties in public? I mean, you could argue that in a court of law if you want. You're a lawyer, but I wouldn't do it. Well, I mean, you. when they're not counting, the ballots are going to be hidden, like locked up somewhere, right? They're, they're, they're in a container. You don't see the ballots then. I've never, I've never seen, I can't recall ever seeing uh, an election office doing counting that had skirted tables. That, that just doesn't happen. But, but you're, you're Ta claiming the, the violation tables, of state law. The tables not that are, you haven't tables seen it before. Are, tables are not. Well, again, it's not transparent. According to 406, if, you, uh, if you're hiding... If you're having skirted tables and you're hiding ballots under there, that is that is not uh, in accordance with the law. And again, you also have 21243B, uh, which is a whole a whole another issue that we can get into. But I've got to move on. There's a, we've got more more people who have questions. Sure. Um, yes. Yeah, sure. So actually, touching on the uh, State Farm Arena a uh, little bit more. I was always wondering because they sent people home at 10 o'clock claiming that there was like some sort of water malfunction. No. But well, yeah, no. So, so let, let me just clarify that. So the water, the, the leaky urinal was in the morning at about 6 o'clock or something, maybe a little before that. And so what they did was, and this is where there's a, it's really clever how, you, how the wording is. They came out and announced that they were, um, and I think this was Shay, announced that they were um, stopping for the night, the counting, and the monitors hung around for about a half an hour, and then they decided to leave, and then right after they left, that was when you saw them, uh, you know, pulling the ballots back out and then starting to resume the, uh, the, the scanning. So that's the way they didn't order the monitors to leave. They just said that they were done. So just, I'm sorry, just. Oh no, it's fine. Want to clarify. Wait, I was just like just saying that you know I mean because it's like that came about. I was watching you know the election closely that night, and and on the television the news reporter said there's been a water main break at Fulton County, and they've they've sent people home. So that's where that information exactly. came. from. Exactly, it was falsely reported uh, for a long, long time. Okay, so the question that I was getting to about that is. Uh, if the um, so if the observers are sent home, is there no law or or or, or legal uh, uh, precedent saying that there has to be bipartisan observers while the, the ballots are being counted? Yeah, there is there is a law. I think that's kind of what we're getting to with uh, 22483B, uh, which I don't have in front of me. But uh, there is a law that's saying that monitors should be present. I think, and I I forgot the exact term of the law. Might be credentialed poll uh, watchers, but I'm not sure. Um, but yes, they're supposed to be monitors, so they should. The monitors should have come back. Well, they should have called the monitors back before they reconvened that scanning. Uh, and it turns out the monitors didn't come back. Uh, they were they were uh, notified that Fulton County had started rescanning, and then they came back within minutes after um, the crew had left. And you can see all that on the video. So, I mean, is there any reason, I mean, does that, does that mean that the, any of those ballots were counted at that time? Would they be rendered illegal because they were not following, you know, precedent? You could technically argue that in, in, in a court of law, I think, that, uh, you know, that that was the case. But nobody ever, I don't, to my knowledge, made that argument. I think it's a fair argument. Well, that, well that's one of the reasons I asked the question is because I've never heard anyone make that argument. Right. I, it's, I think it's an argument that should have been made, probably, uh, but nobody did. That's a really good point. Okay. Um, one, one, one other thing. I actually have a billion things, but I'll just ask one more thing. Um, 
So I'm sure that most people in this room have seen these videos that someone has created with a graph referring to the CIDL reporting to the Edison data, and it shows the Edison data on, on, on a moving graph, you know, going through the course of a month, and he did this in several different states. Do you know what I'm talking about? They play, like, funny piano music to it, oh. and it's where the vote, where the vote totals. Vote spikes. Right, and it's got, it's got, it's got, it's got mail-in ballots, it's got, you know, day of, you know, uh, uh, voting, you know, being counting, you know, like, in, in the different graphs, and they go up and down, basically showing, like, you know, impossible numbers, because votes are being subtracted and added, you know, through the course of a month, and I wanted to know, is there any legitimacy to these videos at all, if you've seen well, them? Well, here, here's what I can tell you. There was a tremendous vote spike in the morning uh, at Fulton. Well, actually, it was statewide, both the morning uh, after the election, November 3rd and November 4th. And they were huge vote spikes. We have the exact numbers, but uh, that all benefited uh, Joe Biden. Now, whether or not they were all legit legitimate votes or not, you know, it's hard to say, but there were those huge vote spikes that suddenly flipped the election, and we saw this in five battleground states all at the same time. It's pretty pretty suspicious. Right. I'm familiar with the vote <coughs> spike in Atlanta that were in, in full yeah. that, you know, went, like, it was like 98% for, for Biden and shot him like 100,000 votes up. Right. We are unfortunately out, out, of, out time. of time. Thank you. For um, I'm sure Garland would be happy to talk to folks out in the hallway and I'm happy to try to answer legal questions. Um, I would tell you, uh, if you'd be so kind to pull out your DragonCon app, rate the, the panel. Uh, it does a lot to, to let people like Scott know what, what to plan next year and what to program. It also lets the Imperial overlords at DragonCon uh, know that people actually came to panels, and that's important. So uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. Hope you have a safe trip home.